Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvina Aditamastu Mavid Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 Om, may the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om, peace, peace. Peace and beneficence be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. Well, good afternoon, dears. Uh, as those of you who are local know, well, you all know, if you receive our new bulletin and newsletters, uh, the puja had to be canceled today because there was a death in the family of our Pujari, Aditya Chaturvedi, which means that uh, according to the rules of that uh, caste and so on, very important uh, rules which Aditya Chaturvedi uh, follows devoutly, that he is ritually impure. And so uh, was unable to serve as Pujari today. So the puja uh, was canceled. And so the class was reinstated. And I'm so glad that uh, you all came. Oh, the, uh, the, it, it, this is just one of those things that happens. Um, so mothers will be done. Here we are. <coughs> So before we begin our discussion of Swami Prabhavananda's translation of and commentary on Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, published as How to Know God, uh, is there anything that anyone would like to uh, say or, or comment uh, or any concern from what we studied previously? Anything at all? All right, dears. We've been discussing concentration. Now we're on to the practice of, uh, of yoga. We discussed fully the aims and purposes of yoga, which of course are to still the thought waves of the mind. And when the thought waves of the mind are sufficiently stilled, uh, a kind of samadhi called Nirvichara Samadhi or Samadhi with seed arises spontaneously uh, when sufficient concentration has been achieved. And uh, that uh, then, according to Patanjali, uh, if the practice is continued and sustained, uh, it's likely that that Nirvichara Samadhi will turn into nirvikalpa samadhi, samadhi without seed, uh, and uh, then liberation is achieved, which in the yoga tradition is called kaivalya, or independence of all conditions and limitation. <clears throat> so now we're discussing the, the uh, practice of yoga. And one of the things that is uh, useful in the practice of yoga is concentration, of course. Uh, and we're talking about various kinds of concentration. And the Swami, Swami Prabhavananda says, the Hindu ritual, ritual being a way of training the mind, as we'll see, the Hindu ritual, which corresponds most nearly 
to the Mass or Lord's Supper is extremely elaborate and its performance requires almost unbroken attention. If any of you have ever attended a puja done by a proper uh, pujari or by a swami of the order, you know exactly what is meant here. The, the, the ritual is elaborate, requiring many items and many activities, and its performance requires almost unbroken attention. For this reason, it is an excellent training for the wandering mind of the beginner. Each successive act recalls the mind to the thought behind the act. Now this is absolutely key. Each successive act recalls the mind to the thought behind the act. Recollectedness is, according to Sri Krishna in the Gita, and of course, according to Patanjali as well, recollectedness, collecting the mind and concentrating it one pointedly, is what achieves uh, our goal of directing our attention inward. <clears throat> so this uh, recalling the mind to the thought behind the act, this is the beginning of the training. You are, too, you are too busy to think of anything else. Thought and action, action and thought, form a continuous chain. And it is amazing to find what a comparatively high degree of concentration you can achieve even from the very first. Now, the Swami wasn't talking theoretically. He trained many, many, many young people uh, and older people too come to that, but many people in the ritual worship. So he, when he says it's amazing, it must have amazed him to see how these people who were sincere and dedicated uh, achieved a relatively high degree of concentration very quickly. Also, ritual gives you a sense of serving God in a humble but very direct and intimate manner. Serving God in a very direct and intimate manner. <clears throat> this now speaks to another aspect of our developing uh, this one-pointed concentration because of the relationship. If you're with someone that you truly are loving uh, in your relationship with, intimate and direct, your attention is very focused on that person. So uh, this is what the Swami means. In an humble but very direct and intimate manner. It is of vital importance, said Swami Brahmananda. Swami Brahmananda was Swami Prabhavananda's teacher, and Swami Brahmananda was the spiritual son of Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother. It is of vital importance, said Swami Brahmananda, that a man begin his spiritual journey from where he is. If an average man is instructed to meditate on, the, on if the average man is instructed to meditate on his union with the absolute Brahman, he is not, he will not understand. Of course not. Of course not. It's absolutely impossible. He will neither grasp the truth of, of it, nor be able to follow the instructions. Hmm. However, if that same man is asked to worship God with flowers, incense, and other accessories of the ritualistic worship, his mind 
will gradually become concentrated on God and he will he will find joy in his worship. This is a quote from Swami Brahmananda that you can find if you want to know more about what Swami Brahmananda said about these things in Swami Prabhupada's book about Brahmananda called The Eternal Companion. So we're talking now about this first aphorism where Patanjali says these are the things that are helpful to gain concentration. Study in the context of this aphorism means study of the scriptures and of other books which deal with the spiritual life. It also refers to the practice of japam, <clears throat> the repetition of the name of God. Japam, as we'll talk about tomorrow morning, uh, when we speak about the significance of mother worship, we'll talk about what happens when you make japam. Many of us uh, here in this congregation uh, uh, for the last for the days September 25th to October 5th were chanting either their own mantra or most probably uh, Jai Shri Durga. Jai Shri Durga is a mantra. Chanting a mantra is called japam. The practice of japam, repetition of the names of God, is very a very effective way to gain concentration. Why? Because you have to push away all of the distractions and return your attention again and again to the, the practice that you are undertaking. So having come this far, any comments from your own wisdom or experience or any questions or concerns? that any of this right raises. Oh, brother, if somebody wants to learn the rituals, um, like in my family, my grandmother knew and my mom also sort of knows some of these things, but like we ignored it, you know, in, in childhood, we thought all this is superstition and, you know, uh, and, and then we forgot <laughs> it and we never paid attention. And I think that's the, that's the case with large, large section of people and if you want to recover that and with a deeper insight what do we do uh there are two ways that immediately come to mind uh there is a, a a training video available from uh the uh vedanta society of san diego swami hari namananda he uh, he teaches people uh, the ritual worship and he has a video, a training video for you to, uh, to watch. And uh, you can also download the instructions as a PDF. Uh, and uh, it's very, uh, Swami Hari Namananda is a very accomplished Pujari. So his ability to instruct us in English that we can understand is, uh, is uh, very uh, great. So you can do that, and then uh, you can watch, uh, it's streamed live, you can watch Swami Chetanananda do the ritual worship each evening, the Arati, which is a five-item puja, the way it's done there. Uh, the, this is the simple form that uh, Hari Namananda also teaches. It's a five-item worship. Um, and uh, you can watch Swami Chetanananda do it. I'm sure there's also videos of, of him doing it. Uh, you can also watch the pujas of their video of their pujas. Uh, and uh, he does 16 item worship there. So you can you can get this training remotely. Uh, at some point when the virus is no longer such an issue, we will have Hari Namananda back here to do this training again. It was very popular when he was here. People very much liked it. The 
the, the uh, chapel was full of people learning from the Swami. And so uh, uh, those are two ways, Rajiv, that I know of right off hand. Uh, if I uh, if I tell somebody that I, I forgot about ritual worship in India and I came to the West to learn it, it would well, be such a funny there's, story. <laughs> there's there are, there are many ironies in life, uh, and uh, you know there. Well, I, there were many things that I learned in my childhood from my grandmother and from the Methodist minister, Pop Taylor, that I then forgot in my pursuit of poetry, passion, and so on, as I, as I got into uh, puberty and adulthood. <clears throat> and it took coming back to Swami Prabhavananda for those things to be recalled to me. So I had to go from... Uh, from my uh, from age ten to age thirty, those twenty years, much was forgotten, and neglected. Uh, but then coming back uh, to Swami Prabhavananda, uh, many of those memories were reinvigorated, and uh, and then he taught, of course, uh, he deepened that um, for me. Much of what was recovered was recovered <clears throat> from reading his book, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' teaching, Sermon on the Mount, according to Vedanta, which is a book that I recommend for any spiritual aspirant, but particularly those of you who come from a Christian background and wish to understand what it is that Vedanta makes of Christianity. And when I say makes of, I mean that in a very literal sense. Uh, Christianity is alive and well within the practices of the uh, Ramakrishna Mission Centers, both in India and here in the United States. Uh, the Ramakrishna Mission uh, was informally founded. The Ramakrishna Order was informally founded on Christmas Eve of 18... 87. Uh, I can tell that story to anyone who wants to hear it sometime. So it's fascinating. And then there are many, many instances of, of uh, personal encounters between Swamis of the Order and, and uh, uh, devotees of the Order, disciples, uh, and Christ. So this business of uh, repetition of the names of God, I think I mentioned in this or some other class that one of the more powerful mantras is the uh, Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Just that simple little, it's a mantra. It contains two bijas, Christ and mercy. And bijas are the seed words from which uh, as, uh, as Swami Vivekananda says, the potentiality of uh, spirituality naturally manifests. Swami Vivekananda said, religion is nothing more than the manifestation of the divinity already within. <clears throat> and so that's what these seed words do. They, they, they blossom to flowers of spirituality. Thank you, Rajiv. Anything else from anyone? Um, Rajiv Shankara? Oh, Balaji, um, you go first. No, no, okay. I just wanted to tell if somebody is interested at the temple on some of the festival days, they do that group pujas where they give all the items and the priest chants the mantra and he will tell you how you do the things. Oh, very good, Rajiv. There you go. Talk to Balakrishna and find out more details about this. There's hands-on training. Can't beat it. <clears throat> they know those priests. They know that many people who've come here, uh, who've immigrated here, and particularly the children of those people who've immigrated here, uh, are, uh, are uh, largely ignorant of these things, except as you said, having seen them as children or, 
or grandchildren and uh, and regarded them with some skepticism because that's the that is the zeitgeist of our age is skepticism and adharma avidya and uh, swayam yes brother shankara <clears throat> i um just wanted to share um i was listening to a podcast this morning uh, by this young uh, person from india it was on connection between neuroscience and uh, the the brain you know the thought process and everything so it was a one hour long but i'm going to try and condense it the portion of it that i feel pertains to our um, uh, mantra or whatever kind of meditation which you have often talked about jill bolte taylor and those neural la- neural loops and neuroplasticity mm-hmm. so the gist of this thing what um, i got was um our you know uh, the hardware of our brain has billions of neurons and they talk to each other through what are called as synapses and there are trillions of synapses and uh, we all use all of them because some people believe that only 10% we use but in this that neurologist was telling that we all use all of them but we don't use them efficiently so <laughs> 10% we use efficiently so also i believe in uh, some electrical uh, engineering there are these efficient circuits and non efficient circuits um so uh, a, a concrete example would be if um, you know i i want to uh, talk to a person but i don't have their cell phone but my another friend has their cell phone so i tell tell my friend okay you tell uh, i tell b that you tell c what i want but that takes a long time for that information but if i have c's cell phone number i can directly talk so um meditation is or any of these processes are like making these circuits more efficient um so if the a wants to talk to b it keeps on teaching b um what it b needs to learn so that a and b can then talk effectively so something like that and the other thing he said was um when we focus on the breath uh when it says turn inwards breath starts at the brain stem level so we are literally kind of turning the loop uh, rather than outside we are going within ourselves to the basic um place where you know um our breath comes from so in other words there is this uh, part of the brain called amygdala whose only function is tell us where to focus so if there is like a basket of fruit and a tiger uh, we want the fruit but at that time escaping the tiger is more important so it tells okay pay attention to the tiger so by <coughs> meditating we are treating the uh, oh sorry we are training the amygdala slowly on where to focus something like that that was the gist of the very podcast. very good all that all that is it. and uh what did we were going to say education is nothing more than training of the nerves he said this in 1893 <laughs> so he was somewhat ahead of these uh neuroscientists education is nothing more than the training of the nerves um, so we train the nerves just as we would train ourselves to hit a tennis ball by repeatedly following the instructions of a teacher qualified teacher on how to hit the tennis ball and slowly the 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 muscles and the nerves learn how to do that the exact same thing exact same thing happens when we repeat the mantra and then even more miraculous things than have been mentioned happen as will be discussed tomorrow morning in tomorrow morning's talk yes um and this particular neurologist was also very humble apparently he's been uh, trying to do a series of things on uh, the neuroscience of the gita verses but he was uh, very humble to admit that neuroscience <coughs> is way behind um <laughs> yeah. yes this but they uh, want to get 
Yeah, Henry David Thoreau remarked on that. They're one of the great American spiritual philosophers. That the that the uh, Gita was among the most advanced. He said the most advanced book that he had ever read. Uh, so we now have the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna as well, which are very appropriate. I mean, depending on who you believe, the teachings of Sri Krishna were uh, offered uh, within the context of Sankhya Yoga, basically, uh, from that frame of reference, <coughs> Sankhya philosophy, uh, uh, somewhere between 2,500 and 5,000 years ago. Uh, Sri Ramakrishna spoke uh, in the last century, uh, not the last century, century before last now, we're somewhat into this 21st century, but uh, Holy Mother spoke right on into 1920 in Brahmananda till 22. All of these, the, the Holy Quartet, as Swami uh, Prabhupada used to call them. So these are very contemporaneous uh, 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 reformulations of the ageless truth, the Sanatana Dharma, which is the way I translate Sanatana Dharma, the ageless truth. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Okay. Anyone else? Anything? Okay. On we read. <clears throat> the dedication of the fruits of one's work to God is a spiritual exercise of vital importance. I'll read this again. And when the Swami says vital importance, you cannot imagine how deeply he means this. It isn't a question of some sort of superficial book knowledge. He knows it. Hmm? You've all heard me tell the story, who spoke? This is the devotion. This is the dedication of one's efforts to God understanding that God is the doer. God alone is the doer. That's what's behind what the Swami is saying. The dedication of the fruits of one's work to God is a spiritual exercise of vital importance, especially to those who are compelled by their duties to lead very active lives, especially to those who are compelled by their duties to lead very active lives. Now, who, except a recluse these days, can avoid leading a very active life? The world simply demands it. Busy, 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 busy. Endless noise, relentless, relentless activity, relentless confusion. So, it, we are all fall into this category these days. Those who are compelled by the world, not just their duties, to lead very active lives. It is known as karma yoga. Hmm? Karma yoga. Live sacramentally, Krishna said. Offer everything to me. It is known as karma yoga, the way of action the way of union, the way to union with God through the performance of God-dedicated action. In following karma yoga, the devotee's whole life becomes one unending ritual. Now hear this. This can be your life. One unending ritual, rather than sitting in front of the shrine and waving this and, and uh, doing that and so the other things that are done in the ritual, your life becomes an unending ritual. <clears throat> Since every action is performed as an offering 
or devotion to God, every action, and you 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 make this a mental or even verbal, oh Lord, this day and all it contains, my Lord, whatever your David, oh beloved one, this day and all it contains is offered to thee, all actions and their fruits, all moods, all projections, all feelings, all thoughts, all perceptions, all memories, all reveries, all knots of the heart, all attitudes, all aptitudes, all tendencies. May all these be offered at thy beloved, blessed, holy feet. May all be oblations to the fire of Brahman. You can start and end your day this way. And then as you go through the day, particular actions like eating, taking pills, everything. Sri Krishna is very, very de detailed in describing this in the Gita. He, he tries to be exhaustive. Don't leave anything out. Even the things regarded as unpleasant, like physical elimination, the calls of nature. He mentions that specifically. He offer even that to me. So this is not some sort of imagining. This is something you do. You do. We learn by action. We train our nerves by doing. Now, any question about any question about these things? Any comments from anyone about their own experience? When you say all projections, what is a projection? Uh, when you think uh, ahead, uh, when you think, oh, I know what tomorrow will bring. Oh, I, I, I'm very happy about what tomorrow will bring. Or I dread what tomorrow will bring. Or for that matter, the next instant. We really don't know anything about what's going to happen. We don't know a thing, but we continue to project. Our mind continues to imagine that it knows what's going to happen and react accordingly. It's just a way of being unpresent. It's just a way of being distracted. So projections, projections, moods, we understand moods. Moods are what happens because of the gunas. So our projections come to that all thought but uh projections are a particular uh so the instruction to me when i was uh, just a beginner is set aside the past stop looking ahead what you know already has already been said again and again and again we rehearse what we know our mind does it it delights in doing it set aside the past stop looking ahead what you know already has already been said don't pick up a cross too heavy to bear sing this for a while and hear what you hear the mantra that swami Prabhupada gave to me is actually sung he the first the first instructions he gave me were a mantra that is actually uh, not just said, but sung. Sing this for a while and hear what you hear. I did what I could and listened for years. Make me part of this became my prayer. He granted that, so it didn't end there. He made a new man and he is now here. Oh, my mind, take this sacred water. Ferment it to the wine of self-surrender. Then sing in praise of all prodigal sons and seek the grace of the holy ones. This is what this, these practices come to. Um, Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. <clears throat> One more um, thing that I sort of processed this morning from listening to the talk um, is that 
we are still largely operating from the limbic system level and the limbic system is programmed for this choosing the feel good because that's important for survival and uh, limbic and avoiding the painful and avoiding the pain and avoiding the painful and it is programmed to choose that so even if we kind of train our prefrontal cortex to suppress the limbic system temporarily, but it, it has the ultimate veto power. So uh, we try, okay, I'm not going to eat that piece of cake, but then the limbic system will veto that and say, oh, it's okay, go ahead, you know, because that feel good is important for survival. And the whole, the spiritual practice, as I guess one gets better, helps to completely like shut down the limbic system um, and kind of uh, accept and, and we work towards that by changing our relationship with the pain and pleasure. Yes, choose the good over the pleasant, Patanjali says. Choose the good over the pleasant. But it's interesting, Jill Bolte Taylor in her new book, Whole Brain Living, talks about the fact that we have two limbic systems the left limbic system, which is the one you were just describing, and the right limbic system that is uh, goes to the right brain cortex. And uh, there is a whole other, uh, she describes these four aspects of the brain, the left limbic system, the left cerebral cortex, the right limbic system, and the right cerebral cortex. She describes them as four characters. And we learn to negotiate among these four characters so that we live. And what does Jill Bolte say, Taylor say when she is asked who she is? I am a being as big as the universe. I am a being as big as the universe. This is not speculation. This is not imagination. This is her knowledge from having lived in that right limbic and right cerebral cortex space during those eight years when she was recovering to living totally there for some time and then slowly recovering her left limbic and left cerebral cortex functions that had been uh, uh, taken away by that massive cerebral hemorrhage she had that she describes in her book, My Stroke of Insight. So she continues her research, she continues her uh, 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 findings, and she continues to write about them. Uh, I haven't finished that book, Old Brain uh, Living, but uh, it's my intention to read it all. But this much I've already discovered is that she talks about the four aspects and they again so parallel what we find in Patanjali. By now she probably knows about Patanjali. She didn't as a, when she first had that, uh, that uh, massive stroke. But by now I'm sure people have acquainted her with the same thing that uh, I rejoiced in when I first read my stroke of insight. My God, she's discovered the same things that Patanjali is talking about. These neural loops are nothing more than samskaras. These are samskaras and vasanas, the groups of, of, uh, of samskaras that are related to one another in some habit or course of action that we reflexively take. Mm. I thought, my God, she's rediscovered these things and she's saying them in a way that is credible to the modern scientific mind. And uh, what a what a joy that was. Thank you. Thank you. What is the name of the book? The new book? Yeah. Oh, okay, her two books are that I know of are My Stroke of Insight. Yes. That was her first book. And yes. the second book is called Whole, W-H-O-L-E, Whole Brain Living. And in the, in the early part of the book, she goes to great, into great detail and takes great pains to, do, to introduce and describe 
these four what she calls characters, the four voices that we hear within us as the left limbic system, the left cerebral cortex, the right limbic system, and the right cerebral cortex. And she says, to our great uh, diminishment, the left limbic system and the right, uh, and the, I'm sorry, the left limbic system and the left uh, cerebral cortex seem to have such dominance that, as Swayam said, the left cerebral cortex seems to have veto power over what we can concentrate on. She insists, and of course, Patanjali insists, that it is absolutely not true. And what we're trying to achieve in the pursuit of yoga as described by <coughs> Swami, by uh, Sage Patanjali, is the stilling of our uh, uh, left limbic system and our left uh, cerebral cortex, learning to ignore their uh, imprecations, their, their seeming uh, dominance. And we find ourselves then in this other realm, the right limbic system and the right cerebral cortex, which has an entirely different character uh, and, and characteristics and leads to that nirvichara samadhi. That's, that samadhi with seeds, that is to say that the, all of those things that we are offering when we practice karma yoga, all those things are still there, but they are dormant. In still in seed form rather than in flowering form. Anything else from anyone? I think that is, uh, you know, because I feel by actually by following some of these uh, spiritual things, what we are doing, what Bhagavad Gita and all those things, our outlook changes. We become samanatum and love and you know, all these things, the characters of the right brain thing would come automatically, but slowly. So yes. the more we practice, the more this, we could feel it and we could see it in our own uh, mind. Oh, how beautifully said, uh, Balakrishna Ji. Yes, we can feel it, we can see it, we can hear it. And it is a manifestation of the divinity already within. The divinity is, is within us as well as the, uh, vidya is present as well as avidya. And this selection of the good, this uh, uh, attraction toward the, ple the, uh, the attraction toward the uh, pleasant, I'm sorry, not the good, this attraction toward the pleasant that which is pleasing to us and our aversion to the unpleasant there's there's something of the left mind in the left limbic system <clears throat> and so we learn to ignore them now, except when as as uh, swayam pointed out if there's a bowl of fruit and a tiger well of course you're not going to ignore the tiger um you're going to make sure that you are safe from the tiger but you can even reach a state where, and this is a matter of direct experience, you can even reach a state where when approached by a tiger, the reaction is simply nothing more than tiger. There's no reaction of attraction or aversion, simply and in this moment, the tiger becomes disarmed. Is this a matter of just direct experience here? What did Ramana Maharshi say? Ramana Maharshi was 
meditating uh, in a cave on the Arunachala hill that he loved so. And he would spend the nights there. He began to uh, attract disciples and devotees. And they said, oh, master, you must not do this. There are, there are tigers. The tigers will uh, find you by their smell and they'll come and attack you and eat you. And Ramana Maharshi very calmly said, no, if you do not behave as a man, the tiger will not behave as a tiger. And when I first read that, it unlocked the mystery of the biblical story, Daniel in the lion's den. If you know that story, Daniel was uh, to be martyred by being fed to the lions. So there was a, 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 a den of captive lions, very angry lions because they were captive. Daniel was put into that lion's den. Now, of course, Daniel was capable of what we're studying here, if you read about Daniel in the Bible, the Old Testament. Daniel was capable of these things. And so he did not behave as a man. And the lions did not behave as lions. They did not attack him. So, actually, Sarvapriyananda says the one of the uh, swamis in Himalayas. Uh, he was in a small hut, and uh, there was a you know a roar of tiger and all those things. All the people around him, they're all so scared and uh, you know shut off the whatever the protection they were trying to get. But the swami thought himself. I'm a sannyasi. What am I scared of? And then in the middle of the night, he went out and he sat in the forest. Whole night he was uh, just meditating. Yes. And, and, and his fire went out and the tiger approached, came and looked in his face and the Swami opened his eyes and all that arose in his mind was tiger. And then he closed his eyes again. The, the tiger lay down, put his head in the man's lap, took his left paw, her, it was actually a female tiger, took her left paw, put it on his right hand, extended her claws just a little bit just so that it could be felt that was it finished hmm? you know who else <laughs> describes this hmm. amazingly franz kafka the 19th century Eastern European writer. I forget what nation he was actually from. I think he was in Vienna when he wrote, but I don't remember. He describes this, the same thing. So this vision has come to many. Mm. You can read this in his, in his short works. This is, this is a reality. It is, it is the reality beyond what the left limbic system knows. To behave not as a man, which is to behave as the left limbic system would have you behave in the left mind. To not behave in that way. To not project in fear what will happen when a tiger approaches. Now, of course, for most of us, 
this would simply be, if we did that, it would be hypocrisy. It would be posturing. So, of course, we would need to be like those people that Balakrishna described to seek refuge from the tiger. For us to pretend that the tiger is no, uh, that we, <clears throat> that we wouldn't actually manifest fear in the face of the tiger would be hypocrisy. So we shouldn't do that. It wouldn't serve us well. That's why we shouldn't do it. It's not like shouldn't, shouldn't. It's just it wouldn't serve us well. Hypocrisy does not serve us well. Um, Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. Um, I think even if we wanted to, we just couldn't. I mean, like I cannot imagine myself um, sitting here in this room and thinking all these things, but if there's uh, a fire, I would run out. It, it's, it's almost... Oh, well, yes, of course, dear. Yeah. And also what I was thinking was um, after a certain amount of um, Shravana and Manana, my, I think Shraddha has come to a point where there's, I would say, much less doubt than when I began the journey. The challenge and also understand that there's nothing that can replace the actual practice uh -huh. of meditation. Um, having said that, I guess I'm also not in a position to go away to an ashram and, you know, do 24-7. So how best to do what I can do with the day-to-day -to, -day to uh, you know, focus everything towards that practice? Well, we just read it in what the Swami said. The resort is to karma yoga. Offer every moment of every day, every thought, every action, every feeling, every perception, and the natural tendency of the mind to fall into reverie, dwelling on the past, either something fearful or something pleasant that happened there, or to project ahead, all, all of these things. That's why they're all mentioned in that little prayer. This is the way to live each day. And, and then during the day, of course, having made that as a, as a, as a way of being with the divine when you get up in the morning, of course it recurs to you during the day. Recollectedness, recollectedness, recollectedness. There are other strategies. <clears throat> there are other strategies, of course. Bhakti yoga is another way of doing this. But you also end up offering everything to the divine in bhakti yoga. You just do it differently. You do it out of love and awe and reverence it isn't it isn't being sacramental what is sacrament what is a sacrament a sacrament is the outward manifestation of the divinity of the grace within that's what krishna means when he says live sacramentally think about the divinity the truth that the that god alone is the doer but in bhakti you don't be thinking about you know, you just think, you know, I love God. I love everything about God, even the bad things. Uh, you know, somehow I must bring myself even to kiss, kiss the blemish on God's body, as St. Thomas Aquinas said. I must learn to shake the hand that afflicted blows on me. All of these things. These are all part of bhakti yoga. And then, of course, jnana yoga, that's a whole other way of being with this. Or you simply set the whole blazing thing aside. You don't try to negotiate with the mind. According to the, the, the Advaitists, you annihilate the mind. 
You simply ignore it. As Vashishtra says to Rama, it's only a vibration of consciousness anyway. Nothing more than that. Nothing more than it doesn't need to distract you. But Sri Ramakrishna says that's so hard now in this Kali Yuga, the end of the Kali Yuga, with this endless noise and relentless confusion and this dependence on stimulation and food. So hard. So Sri Ramakrishna says, Bhakti, Bhakti, that's the way. And then, of course, he describes in his practice of bhakti a lot of what sounds an awful lot like karma yoga. Thank you, Swayam. Thank you, Bala. Thank you, everyone who asked a question. Thank you, all who were silent. Uh, it, it, it doesn't... Uh, you, your presence is felt even if you never say a word. But most of you spoke up today. Yes, Paul. I just wanted to see, it says, you know, uh, God's will will prevail over my will. How do we practice that? <laughs> well, the, the thing to do is look back over your life, Balaji, and see, you know, it, it said there, there's a way to make God's, God laugh, and that is to make a plan. Uh, man proposes, God disposes. This is, this is a Christian uh, uh, formulation of this. Uh, if, we, if we look back over our life, we have, if, we, if we're honest with ourselves, what happened that brought us to where we are I, I I I understand where, especially I have the full understanding of that because my life, every turn, is uh, God dictated. I know I haven't thought about even I haven't even had a faintest idea that I had to come to U.S. Right. Okay. I it's so many uh, things that happened to me. I realize it, but. Yeah. When we are doing small little things like uh, Swami Brahmananda, once he was in Chennai and he was <laughs> supposed to come back to, uh, you know, Belur Math. And, uh, you know, he said one date, but when it comes to that date, he said, no, I didn't get the mother's permission. I'm not going today. Yes, he asked, he asked Swami Prabhavananda to, to fix a date from the almanac, an auspicious date for him to return from Chennai to, to Bellarmont. And then uh, the, the day came and he didn't go. And Swami Prabhupada said, what's up, Maharaj? And he, he said just exactly, hang on just a second. It was a scam call. Um, so the, the idea is simply to be as recollected of the truth as you can be. What does Krishna say is our fundamental delusion? That we are the doer. What does Sri Ramakrishna say? God alone is the doer. What does Vivekananda say? There is only one existence, one being. It is doing everything. What does Vashishta say? Vashishta says, the absolute is the truth of reality. Everything else is merely a vibration of consciousness that appears to us as a magic show, as a mirage. So we just have to keep reminding ourselves and reminding ourselves and reminding ourselves. And of course, our left mind will make itself felt. This is why we have to then say, all right, everything that arises in my left mind, I offer to the Lord. 
I know from what you've told me, it is nothing more than the gunas brushing up against my samskaras. You know, the image that I like to use in my mind is that these samskaras are like this immense, uh, you can't see the dimensions of this field of wind chimes. And the winds of the gunas, the sattva, the rajas, the tamas, they brush against these wind chimes. And that, that gives a rise in us to feelings, thoughts, perceptions. It's nothing more than the gunas brushing against our samskaras. Now, we, we didn't create these samskaras, we, as we sit here. These are eons old, eons old. This is what Vivekananda says. You think you're somebody right now? You have been in some name and form for eons accumulating these samskaras. So here along come the gunas constantly, constantly, constantly at play, constantly brushing up against these wind chimes of our samskaras. So what do we do with that? And the actions that naturally, the speech and the actions that naturally flow from it, we offer it all to the divine presence. This is thine. You created the universe. You created all of these names and forms as the Ahamkara, the eye maker. You created all these names and forms, all these eons. And so here this sits, this human being with the three graces, human birth, the desire for liberation. Otherwise, why would you be here on a Saturday? From noon to one or thereabouts. Why would all this happen? So you have the grace of human birth. Human birth. Now you're in this form with this name, a human being, which is a verb, not a noun. Uh, you are being human. You are the divine being human. So you have this human being. You have the desire out of that, somehow the spark of desire for liberation has, has awakened in you. So you have these two graces and you have the grace of a qualified teacher. I think everyone that I'm looking at here on the screen, all of you have taken Diksha from a Ramakrishna order Swami. I know Triguna has, I know Bala has, I know Brahmadas has. I, I, I don't know who uh, Haima's guru is, but I'm reasonably certain she has too. I think, is, is, is Sarvadevananda your guru, Haima? That, that's Sarvadevananda is the one whom I contacted. I'm reading books to get initiated. I have I certain see. homework to I do, see. so I'm doing my homework. I see. Okay. When I'm ready, I will go so to LAR. You, but you, you have a qualified teacher. It is Sarvadevananda. He will give you the instructions. You know, uh, and, and you know when you when you receive Diksha, you receive the mantra, but you also receive other instructions. This is what's meant by that line, I did what I could and listened to the mantra for years. Mm. We do, you know, we practice, we, we follow our instructions as best we can. I know Rajiv has taken Diksha and I know that uh, Swayam has taken Diksha. And so, I and, and it. yes. I also have a mantra my mother gave me when I was in third, eighth grade, well, she went she went to a mat, and then it is so similar to what Hari Ramananda gave to me. When I compared, both have the same everything. Well, so, you see, so it's just truth. Truth is one. Those those who exactly. are wise call it by many names. Exactly, exactly. She went to a Brahmangari mat, and then she got the mantra. Well, and and she gave it to you at an early age. How blessed! Very early age. How yes. blessed is that, dear? So that you, every you, night, repeat that mantra. That's I, I, I tell you this, you are, you have, you are full of grace to have uh, Swami Sarvadevananda as your teacher. 
he has well and truly become that divine, uh, that face of the divine that is a qualified teacher. Um, when he was here in May, you were here. Yes. You, you encountered him. How was he? He was the very, the very model of a uh, of a shtita pragna, uh, uh, one who is established in the steadfast truth. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I dropped everything and came out there for that weekend, and I found it very inspirational. Ah, uh, yes. You even phoned him later and told him that. Yeah, well, bless you. So anything else from anyone before we start? <clears throat> Brother Shankara, really yeah. quick. You know that um, uh, man proposes, God disposes, um, uh, I don't know whether to call it a proverb or a statement. Um, when I was, I guess, emotionally and spiritually uh, less uh, aware, it used to have a very negative connotation. Um, the dispose I equated to discard. So it brought a sense of fear. Oh, God is there, let me keep, as if he's waiting to, oh, you decided you will do this, I'm not going to let you do that. But now I think I take the meaning of disposition as, there's also a way to describe um, disposition as a particular direction, particular. Yes, exactly. Uh, so when we take it that way, then it becomes a source of strength. Yes, exactly. Well, this is because of your Shraddha, dear. Now you're seeing things differently. You're seeing things differently because of the Shraddha. And so there you are. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's how it works. And uh, it, it is a Christian proverb, and it is meant to be ambiguous in just the way you have described it. God disposes. Hmm. Brother, there is a, uh, this image of uh, Kali who's riding on a donkey. And I was sort of contemplating on it. What does it mean? And then I, I thought, may I, I think it means is that every donkey you see in the world, uh, even including in egoistic donkeys or what? I mean, even you, I can consider myself as a donkey when I'm in like a like a not so conscious state. It's actually Mahakali who rides all of us, um, or or uh, or Kali who rides all of us, uh, and and you know, irrespective of the person you see, uh, ultimately it's she was sort of treating everybody as puppets uh, and her instruments to do her work. Well, I don't ever like the word puppet. It 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 it, it just has such a poor connotation for us. But we we are definitely instruments of the divine will. But what we have to understand is we are that divine who is riding that donkey. We are that divinity. We are that. And so what did St. Francis of Assisi call his body? He called his bra body brother ass, which is another word for, he wasn't making a pun on the word ass as we use it in English, because that is, that's just a translation of what he said. Uh, he meant brother donkey. He called his body Brother Donkey. And when he was at the end of his life, he was asked by one of his uh, uh, the, the junior monks, well, uh, Master, if there were something different that you might have done during your life, what would it have been? And I'm sure that uh, the, the monk was expecting him to say, I, you know, uh, this, that, some, some scriptural thing. And and uh, the and Assisi thought about it for a few moments, and he said, "Well, I think I would have been kinder to Brother Ass. I think I would have been kinder mm -hmm. to my body." <laughs> so uh, this is uh, yes, but you're right, Rajiv. This is the divine riding everything. There is nothing but the divine, this over and over, Krishna tells us, Ramakrishna tells us, you know, Vashishta tells us, all, 
Adi Shankaracharya tells us, Madhava tells us. <laughs> they may qualify it in, in various terms, but the wise know the truth. They call it by many names. And you know, the, this is why we spent that month and a bit, one time studying the wisdom of Don Juan Matus, the teacher out of the Toltec tradition, which arose in Mexico. It, 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 we forget that it exists here. It could also be taught from, from the fourth book of the Hopi, you know, the Hopi people in, in uh, Arizona. The traditional Hopi, amazing people, amazing people. And as true to their truths, to their, to their great spiritual traditions, and, and as a result, many saints among the Hopis. What did Swami Vivekananda say? The test of the truth of a spiritual, the test of the truth of a spiritual tradition is does it produce saints? And so the Toltec tradition produced saints, Don Juan and Don, John, Don Gennaro, the two people featured in Carlos Castaneda's book, uh, uh, journey to Islam, which is what we taught for that month. The saints hmm, gave their lives on behalf of others. This is the definition of sainthood. So, you know, this is it's 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 in a sense it's everywhere we look. If we go looking, most people remain, and this is not judgment, it's just observation, it's just a, a truth. Most people may, may remain too distracted by the activities and vicissitudes of life to begin to look. And so the, the divine is very compassionate toward them. Even the more, even the more seemingly evil and destructive ones. What does the Chandi say? Oh, mother, don't you destroy all Asuras? Don't you reduce to ashes? Don't, oh, mother, don't you reduce to ashes all Asuras, demonic personalities? Don't you reduce to ashes all Asuras? by mere sight, but you direct your weapons against them so that even the inimical ones, purified by the missiles, may attain the higher worlds. Such is your most kindly intention toward them. Why? Because she is their mother also. She is the mother of everything. Brahma, in introducing her in the very beginning, of the Devi Mahatmya, the Chandi says, Mother, you are the great Devi, the great goddess, as also the great Asuri. She, Mother, has a terrible face. Hmm? She has a terrible form, more than one terrible form. I'm told we just do not want to encounter Bhagala, for example. Hmm? So when we, when we live with the recollection that there is only the divine, only, only, only the divine, then things become, as you said, Swayam, simpler, simpler. And just a final word <coughs> about why there was no puja today. Aditya Chaturvedi, as you all know, was meant to be the pujari today. There was a death in his family, which rendered him by the rules of his caste, ritually impure, and so unable to do the puja. That lasts for a period of time. But what I want to say is just 
let's have a sweet thought of love and con condolence for, for Aditya and his family. They've lost a loved one. That's always hard. You know, the loved one was, according to Sri Krishna and all of the teachers, the great teachers, that loved one is fine. You know, they've just dropped the garment and gone on in their subtle form to whatever's next. But we're, we're left with the sorrow of being without our loved one. And then there are these ritual consequences for those of the very high Brahmin caste to which Aditya Chaturvedi belongs. And that means some obligations and some ritual condolence that goes on. But from our hearts, among ourselves, as Swami Prabhupada said, when asked about the power of prayer, he says, well, yes, prayer works. What do you think you are separate? No, we are not separate from Aditya Chaturvedi and his family. So any loving and soothing thoughts that can arise in our hearts will be felt by them. Whether they know it or not, it doesn't matter whether they know anything. We can send them a card, we can do whatever we like, but uh, <clears throat> more than anything else, let us feel you know, Aditya was very sorry when he called me this morning. He was already making the sandal paste for the puja when his mother called him from India, told him that this happened. And of course, he knew immediately that meant he could not do the puja. So he called me immediately. And I hope you all got the bulletin uh, that uh, there was to be no puja this morning. Anything else from anyone? So sorry to hear that, Brother Shankar. We will text him or send him an, yeah. send him an email or something. Just, just tell him that you heard that there was you suffered Thank a lot. You. Whatever you you know what to say. Yes. I don't need to tell you what to say. Thank you, you Brother. I you're uh, very good at those things. Yes, Rajiv. I have uh, concrete, physical, and material evidence uh, that. If somebody in our family, even distant, uh, like somebody who know they die, and if we pray for like one of the spiritual masters to accept or like you know um, for them to take refuge uh, in 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 their spiritual consciousness, that 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 prayer is actually granted. I, oh. I have like physical. Uh, in my in my personal life and relations, I've seen this is like a physical evidence, you know, which is like verified. How beautiful! By somebody praying, and somebody had a prayer, and other person had an experience of that vision. So, I, I know that that prayer works. Oh, thank you, Rajiv, for that affirmation. And uh, and yes, I think all of us, if we look into our lives, will find evidence that there is a connection, a deep abiding connection between ourselves and others that cannot be explained in a physical sense. <clears throat> Certainly our dreams will tell us this. Thank you, Rajiv. That was very sweet. Anything else from anyone? All right, dears. There's, of course, RT this evening uh, at 6.30. And then tomorrow morning uh, at 11 o'clock, the significance of mother worship according to Swami Swahananda. And one of the features, I uh, give this talk every year at this season of the year, uh, it was always with variations. And one of the variations this year will be uh, a discussion of what actually happens when we chant a mantra, when we chant Jai Sri Durga? What actually happens? And why is it so powerful? Anything else? All right, dears. So good as always to be with you. This is uh, a beautiful book we're studying. And of course, we see what kind of conversation among 
holy company it uh, gives rise to. And it is precious, precious beyond. I mean, just think of life in the world and think of life with these people that we're gathered with right now. How different, how different, how different. So Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai, Durga, Durga, Durga. May we be safe. May we be healthy. May we be cheerful. May we have peace of mind. And may we go forward in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father. So until tomorrow morning, for those of you who decide to join us, uh, much love and uh, have, a, have a great rest of your day and night. Jai Mah.